This will be our last year on the Baal Shem Tov and Yerat Hashem, at least directly the Baal Shem Tov. We're going to go on afterwards to uh, uh, the Vilna Gaon and Miss Nagdus. But in the meantime, I want to do the last handout of the Baal Shem Tov, which is one which is entitled Revolution. And um, the person who, who wrote this article, whose name is Yankee Tauber, uh, talks about... Um, revolutionaries, people who change things in the world in a significant way. And in the second paragraph in the article, he says, but there is something that else that is rarer still. Something that happens perhaps once in 500 years, perhaps once in a thousand. It happens that someone comes along and says something so revolutionary that it changes the way we look at ourselves and our world. But it is neither new nor in the final analysis unexpected. For it is something that we already know and already knew. Something that resonates deep within and inside us, requires no proofs to establish its authenticity. Saying there's so much part of our inner truth that our search for truth has blinded us to its knowledge until now. Now, in this paragraph, which seems a reasonable paragraph, there is uh, a certain element of Hasidic uh, uh, thought, which is quite dangerous, if not uh, carefully um, uh, um, held in check. Which is that in Hasidus, there is a downgrading of use, the use of seichel of the use of uh, intellect in matters other than direct learning of Torah. In the end, in other words, of course, as we learn to, the Hashem Tov holds, one must learn Torah. But when it comes to independent thought, so independent thought and intellectual reasoning is often downgraded, downplayed, and what feels right and feels good is something which is upgraded and overplayed. So, for example, one of the early Hasidim who caused a lot of trouble for the Hasidic movements was Rabbi Avraham Kalisker. Rabbi Avraham Kalisker, uh, however you spell this fine, but it's K-A-L-I-S-K-E-R, uh, would do somersaults in the middle of davening. And uh, then that was his way of, uh, uh, of um, uh, expressing his debakus by doing somersaults. And obviously that became very strange in many people's eyes. Uh, but it felt right. It felt good. Felt like this is what he was supposed to be doing in order to come close to Kurdish Baruch Hu. Uh, in, in, in general, the main area in which this manifested itself was in Zmane Tfila. Hasidim, very, very often, in many groups, felt that the Zmane Tfila, the times which were set for davening, should not be binding upon them. There's a marshal about this by one of the early Hasidic masters, I don't remember which one. He says that the people who needs to have a, a specific appointment time with the king. The people come from outside the palace. They have to have specific appointment times when it's their time to see the king. But people who are um, members of the palace, people in the palace, they don't need specific times. They come and go as they please. They're not bound by time. So, so too, who needs specific times for davening? People outside the palace. People who are misnagdim, perhaps, but not chassidim. Who needs, who, who, who doesn't need time for davening? Those are people who, um, who are inside the palace, presumably Hasidim. <laughs> My boss by the showing tonight. If you nearly get a haircut to make sure this doesn't happen. Oh, it's confusing to join Stevis online. <laughs> on air. Okay. I can't even figure out what to do. Oh, there we go. Okay. So the um so the Has the Hasidim uh were uh, Lamala, there's a phrase, especially in Chabad, Lamala mi sechavadas, above intellect and wisdom. There's some level above that. The Hasidists, they would associate that with the keser, the crown, which is above the head, and uh, that it's, it feels right, it seems right. It doesn't have to be checked objectively against what actually we have in the books and in the Mesorah as the Rotz Hashem. So, uh, the, uh, of course, uh, he brings down here that the Baal Shem Tov was this person. And the, in the next page, the second page, these are the things he taught. These, this is the revol these are the things about the Baal Shem Tov which are revolutionary. Of course, it's not an exhaustive list, but it's something which is important to see. That everything we do is meaningful. Our every deed, every word we speak, even a single thought we think, has an effect that reverberates throughout all the worlds and through all of history. Of history. That, that's not the Baal Shem Tov's Chiddush. The Baal Shem Tov uh, is echoing Kabbalah in general. Kabbalah in general has this notion that um, everything we do has a cosmic impact 
and later on with Chaim Volozhner, who wrote the, the standard Misnagic response to Hasidism, and Nefesh Chaim adopts the same position. Everything, at least that a Jew does, not necessarily a non-Jew, but everything a Jew does has cosmic ramifications. It makes worlds and destroys worlds. And then it brings Kedusha or brings Tuma. That everything has the nuance which affects the world in some way, shape, or form. It's like the marshal of the um, the butterfly effect. But a butterfly flaps its wings. It could be that by cause and effect that brings about uh, a, uh, a hurricane somewhere else on Earth. But uh, here, it's by every little flap of our wings, we cause something to happen in Shamayim and in Oretz, which is divine and cosmic. The next thing is that everything that happens in the God's world from top of the own empire to leaves turning in the distant forest is for a purpose specifically guided and directed by the Almighty. A, uh, a purpose that contributes towards the overall purpose of creation. This is a Chiddush of Baal Shem Tov. This, and I mentioned this last time, Hashgacha Pratis to this extent is a Chiddush of the Baal Shem Tov and uh, it's been to a large extent accepted by Am Yisrael much more than Hasidus. There is a statement from the Rebbe Rabbun and Parashishcha that if you have a stick stuck in the sand stuck in sand. They pull it out of the sand. So then particles of sand go back down into that hole. You know, they slide down the, so the side where the stick was, and they go fill the hole a certain pattern. Reverend William says, if you be don't believe that every single granule of sand goes now to a place which the Hashgach of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, meaning Hashem, uh, con complete control, determined for it at that point in time, for that specific space, if you don't believe that, you're apicorous. You're a heretic. So the uh, this makes the Rambam a heretic. Because the Rambam, and I don't think the Rambam meant it literally, you know, it's been, been exaggerating for effect, but uh, the, the Rambam believes that nature determines that. There is nature, and nature determines where each granule of sand is going to go. Physics will determine how it happens. Uh, maybe you can figure it out through uh, calculus. So, uh, the, through other science, scientific and mathematical approaches. But it's not HaKosh Gosh Baruch Hu's Hashkocha at that point in time. Hashem does not, that's not Hashem's concern. Could Hashem concern himself with that? Yes, but it's not significant enough. And therefore HaKosh Baruch Hu put the world into a state in which there are natural processes. And HaKosh Baruch Hu put those processes into effect. It's not that at that moment and that time Hashem decided. Now read this to say, if you th this uh, can lead to the assumption which some Bali Machshava attribute to the Ramban that there is no such thing as Teva. It's just that there's certain nism to which we become accustomed and certain which we, we're not accustomed. That every moment there's a new nace. Where things go, where things happen, it's a new nace made at that moment. It's just that usually it follows the same pattern, so we're used to it, as opposed to something which is radical and different. It's in the similar vein, Rev Dessel writes, that Chiyas HaMesim is not qualitatively different than the growth of a uh, kernel of a uh, stalk of wheat. A stalk both, uh, when a stalk of wheat, a kernel of uh, wheat is from the ground, it rots. And then it grows. So to the human body, it rots. And then it grows. So the Chiyas HaMesim is, very, is similar to a, a wheat kernel growing up, becoming a stalk of wheat. But we're used to seeing stalks of wheat grow. We're not used to seeing people sprouting out of the earth. So this idea of Ashkocha Pratis on all levels, to all times, in all places, is a very unique Hasidic idea, which became the perspective of basically the entire Orthodox Jewish world, which leads to an interesting question. What was true at the time of the Rambam? What's true today? So uh, uh, the Beckhoffer approach to this, the Beckhoffer personal approach, is that um, there's a, there was a it's, a, it's a joke, but, but it has a kernel of truth to it, that the Kotzka Rebbe was once asked, in the Machlokas between the Gura and the Rambam, if Shadim exists, are there demons? Who's right? The Rambam holds that there are no demons, and the Gura says that the cursed philosophy led the Rambam astray. Who's right? So the, the Kotzka Rebbe said, Eil ve Eil they're both right. How so? When the Rambam, there were Shadim, there were demons, time the Rambam comes along and says, there are no Shadim, Tzadik goes up Hakadosh Baruch Hu Mekayim. The Tzadik says something. Hashem follows through. Poof! All the shading disappeared. 
they no longer existed. Along came the Grah, 700 years later, and said to Arshi. At that point, the, the very Kodesh Baruch uh, said, Tzadik Kodesh Baruch Hu, Baruch Hu poof, Shadim come back. So it's a little bit tongue in cheek, but the, the idea I think is true. The Kodesh Baruch Hu changes the way he uh, uh, acts towards creation based on what's happening in time and place. And sometimes the tzaddik determines that, and sometimes Hashem determines that and sends the tzaddik to change things, and it's probably a mixture of both. So either Baal Shem Tov said, okay, I'm going to make a revolution, and I'm going to get everybody leaving leave Hashem Tov this, and you won't have a choice on Kodesh Baruch Hu, but to adjust, so to speak, you know, to, only to our perspective. Well, to the Kodesh Baruch Hu saw, in our generation, we need this the concept of Hashem Tov this. So he's going to change the way he leads the world. And therefore, he created, he sent the Baal Shem Tov down to change things. It's either way, it could be true could, that uh, either way, that the Tzaddik led or a Kodesh Baruch Hu led. But yes, this idea has become widespread and the dominant idea of how Kodesh Baruch Hu runs the world. That our simple faith, our simple commitment to do good is more precious in God's eyes than all the genius of the scholar and all the spirituality of the mystic. Um, yes, that was certainly something which Baal Shem Tov contributed. Unfortunately, in later generations, as we will talk about, uh, Hasidus did not follow through. In fact, we can mention that right now. That from the time of his successor, the Magid Mezrich, Mezrich, M A Z R I T C H, the, the, this no longer became so simple. One had to be connected to a tzaddik, to a rebbe, in order to uh, accomplish Vekus, uh, which means that simple faith and simple commitment to God was not enough. He needed the genius of the scholar, the spiritual, the mystic, in the form of the Rebbe, in order for that to be meaningful. And that was not what the Baal Shem Tov seems to have preached, but that was how Hasidus became. And in that sense, it developed its own hierarchy, levels of Hashivus, of significance, based on without your being a Rebbe, or your proximity to the Rebbe. The God is everywhere and in everything, meaning that in essence there is only goodness, evil, and suffering, and the spirit are but veils behind which he prompt to prompt he eyes to prompt us to rip them away in our quest for him. Obviously, as you know, uh, the first line of that uh, paragraph according, is Apicarsus. It's not true. Even according to Baal Shem Tov, God, God is nowhere and God is not in things, but rather there's divinity in uh, everywhere and there's divinity in everything. The author is unfortunate and we have expressing Apicarsus, but nonetheless, it is Apicarsus. But this is a very capitalistic idea that there's only goodness. Even when suffering and despair are ways in which the Kodesh Baruch Hu hides the goodness in this world. But we know that uh, ultimately for the Gemara, everything which the Kodesh Baruch Hu does is for the best. The question is where we have a difference is when one man does something to another man. But let's leave that out for now. That life is joyous. We live a joyous in every situation under all and any circumstances. Many Hasidim believe this. Not necessarily all Hasidim live by this. It's easier to say than it is to do. But yes, uh, uh, Nachman, who was not always so happy, said, Mitzvah Gidoy Lelios B'Simcha Tomi. It's a great mitzvah to be B'Simcha. That God loves each and every one of us as if he or she was it were his only child. Again, uh, I don't, it's hard to understand that in light of the way Hasidus developed with Rebus and uh, with um, a hierarchy. Uh, I think it's, uh, I, I happen to think this is true. But in Hasidus, you don't find, find it manifest. And so in the Hasidim, there is a belief among some Hasidim that Hasidim are more beloved than Mismagdim. Uh, well, they, they might deny it, but there is such a thing. And it unfortunately works the other way as well. Mismagdim sometimes believe that God loves them and not the Hasidim. And that is a great tragedy. That the truest way to love God is to love each, uh, each and every one of his children. This is certainly true. After Recha Kamocha is the basis of Ava uh, Sashem. They're connected to each other. I think it's in the Hasidus, Haftar Rechakamacha only applies to Jews. Uh, the Groz Tami, the Sefer of Ris, writes that Avas, uh, Avas Reim, to love one's f friends, even applies to non Jews and to the universe in general. So, being Machlekes, how far it applies. Looking to our souls, we know all, know all this to be true. Not necessarily. But the life of the human being is not often not oriented to look into his own soul. That's true. Well, that's why we need teachers. Not so much to tell us what we don't know. So that kind of teaching has its uses too, I should hope so. Otherwise I might be out of a job. 
But the shows what that what we already know. Uh, yes, actually, the teacher is supposed to do both to impart knowledge, but more importantly, to bring out the potential and the talents and the greatness which are in each of their students.